Hi everyone, it's Karen Webster and welcome to our discussion today on the makings of a top FI payments performer. But first, a little context. So the 2018 Winter Olympics are well underway, the biannual display of sports and athleticism at its finest. This year, more than 2,900 athletes will compete across 102 events for the honor and the privilege of bringing a gold, silver, or bronze medal back home. At the top of the medal leaderboard so far is Norway, a country of 5.2 million people who have collected 11 gold, 10 silver, and 8 bronze medals. Now, some people say that they aren't all that surprised. This is the Winter Olympics after all. And in a country with long winters and lots of snow, it's also been said that Norwegians pretty much are born with skis on their feet. But if that were true, it wouldn't explain their somewhat lackluster performance of Olympics past. Most notably, without the 2006 Winter Olympics, where they came home with only two gold medals, and they say a rather humiliating loss to Sweden. An intense period of introspection, focus, training, and investment in technology followed and produced teams that now dominate countries many, many times their size. Big doesn't always mean the best. That's also an appropriate analogy for the topic of our conversation today, the makings of a top FI payments performer, where you'll discover that bigger doesn't always mean top performing, but where an intense focus on a small list of the right things does in fact make all the difference. And with me today to dig into those details is Lisa Fugate, Vice President of Product Management at I2C. Hey Lisa, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Karen. I'm excited to be here. Are you watching the Olympics? Of course. Of course. And it's, I'm seeing uh, how Norway is doing, right? <laughs> yeah. They, they, well, I, I left out the, the part where they, they like to have a lot of fun and spend 250 days together every year training. But uh, I think it's a really <laughs> in interesting analogy um, that sets up this particular discussion, which is one of the series of playbooks that we've been working on together that key off of um, the study that we did um, and published earlier in the year. Um, I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, but I thought I would um, spend a little bit of time just setting the table for you um, as we go through the, the results. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover. We'll, I'll give you a little background about the readiness index itself. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the key findings. We'll really dig into the characteristics of what makes a top payments performer at the very top of their game, um, the role of infrastructure, technology, planning, and methodologies in really driving that top performing um, uh, the, the, that top performing category and keeping it there, and then I guess most importantly, the call to action: what everyone listening can do to get to the top of the leaderboard themselves. So. Um, you ready? Yep, let's go. All right, so um, I will say everyone listening, if you have questions, just lob them our way. We'll be taking questions throughout, so don't, don't keep them to the end. It's much more interesting and fun when, uh, when you guys think of questions and we can respond in real time. So um, a, little, a little backdrop about the index itself, which launched um, a series of playbooks, the first of which is evaluating and analyzing the makings of a top FI payments performer. Um, it, it, it's an interesting collaboration that we did. As I said, we published the index um, earlier, uh, actually the, the end of last year. I keep thinking this is already late into, into 20, uh, 2018, but it's, but it's really not. Um, we talked to a number of banks, actually. We got them on the phone, talked to about 214 of them, we asked them a series of questions about payments innovation, how they do it, um, what gets in the way, what contributes to success, and what things specifically they've done to drive innovation within their organizations. And we defined innovation um, rather broadly, not just new products, which of course I think many people think innovation as just doing entirely new things, but, but really things that are 
enhancements to existing products, things that make what people have now uh, better. We looked at banks across all, at, all asset sizes, but we excluded the top 25 banks because we really wanted to take a very good look at those FIs that are among the smaller, but we have a great representation of those across all those, all those asset sizes. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about how we got to the attributes of the top performer, I don't want to bore you guys with a lot of discussion of statistics, but we did use data science to help us really calibrate across all the responses that we got, the attributes that drive performance across the banks that we talked to, the banks and credit unions and community banks that we talked to, to really understand what makes a top performer a top performer. And I think without giving too much away, um, we found that it's not a matter of size of financial institution, it's really a matter of it making innovation a priority so that it becomes baked into how that FI conducts their, their business, how it allocates funding toward innovation, and how it then takes project plans and sticks to those milestones and deadlines to get innovation quickly into, into the market. Some of the quick high-level responses or the feedback that we, that we gleaned from this study is that um, technology is really an enabler, an equalizer. It's no longer the great divider. There are lots of interesting ways that technology can be brought into an FI to democratize, if you will, the ability to bring innovation into their portfolio of products and certainly out to consumers who want it. And I think that's the other differentiating factor that makes a strong, a strong performer, a top performer, a top performer, and that is a focus on, on serving customers rather than, than playing catch up, trying to put in place the things that have been in market for a while. The top performers have identified what customers are really looking for and have used technology and the investment to support it to actually take that take that into, into the market, and have used a bunch of different technology and innovation methodologies to make that, in fact, a reality. And we'll get into some of those, some of those details now. So, Lisa, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Um, you know, I think that it was a great setup. I love the um, Norway analogy because we truly did find in this survey that it doesn't really matter how big or small you are, right? There's these four, um, you know, key attributes that really play into being a top payments performer. Um, and I think the big takeaway here is really that these um, four key attributes really distinguish, right, between what a top performer is and maybe what a mid or middle performer might be. So the planning, uh, funding, infrastructure, and really speed to market. Uh, I think one of the things we overwhelmingly found was that the top performers possess these attributes in spades as compared to the middle or bottom performers. So what we found at least, what, 70% of the top performers had each of these attributes. So rationally, right, it makes sense that a thoroughly planned strategy that's well-funded would result in the ability to perhaps build innovation quickly, right? Um, I think that kind of makes sense logically. Um, but I think here technology is really the secret ingredient, if you will. Um, and it's a variable that, you know, any FI can have some control over, which I think is one of the biggest differences there. Um, we also saw that, you know, the top performers also did much better than those middle performers in terms of infrastructure, right? 60% scored well compared with just 12% of those middle performing FIs. I mean, that's a pretty big number if you think about it. Um, and these results were consistent across all the FIs of every size. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing to think about, and we mentioned this before about innovation and about what we talked about with the survey, but again, you know, innovation isn't necessarily the next big thing. And I want people to keep that in mind as we talk today. Um, it's also about 
smaller feature functionality or segment specific innovation. And it's about using technology differently to get there, right? Like multiple different lines of credit being used for different purposes or being able to move transactions or, you know, applying for, you know, multiple currencies, those types of things. It all may be technology that's there, but how you put it together changes, right? And, and create some sort of innovation for them. I, I, okay, I, I also, oh, go ahead. I, I, I was gonna say, I also think that, um, you know, that speaks to, the point that you just made, which is the ability for their infrastructure to allow innovation to develop and yep. those products and, and attributes to, to develop and also get to market more quickly. Yep, absolutely. You know, it, it, again, if you've got the right infrastructure in place, making some of those tweaks or some of those changes that has a big impact on the market or on their cardholder base is easier to do, right? And it's faster to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I think okay. the, um, I think that the, the data that we that we looked at together and and observed is that uh, ninety percent of these top performers get new products into the market before before others do. And and that makes a right. difference in a very hotly competitive market uh, like payments within financial services. So why don't we dig into some of the some of the the details that support the top line. Great. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with you. Getting to market that quickly in, a, in front of everybody else makes a big difference. And I think you'll see that here in some of these, uh, some of this data too. Uh, and I think this data is pretty compelling. Um, so if you look at planning, um, eight out of the top 10 performers, you know, focus on feature innovation um, over the next three years, right? That, that's where they're looking at. Um, and 100% of them have defined priorities over the next three years, right? And, and if you're looking at it, the focus on an innovation is what, more than double? right, mm -hmm. those middle tiers. So it becomes, as you mentioned before, just part of the, um, the thread and part of the blanket and part of what they do every day, right? Um, funding, if you look at that, only 12% of those average performers have 50% or more of their budget allocated to innovation, only 12%. Um, that's a pretty big difference when it's about, what, more than seven? Um, out of 10, you know, leaning towards eight of the top performers that actually have at least 50% of their budget allocated to innovation. Um, and, and a lot of this is, and you'll see this soon, it's focused on payment, but in um, innovation specifically, you know, and we see this with a lot of our clients, right? Their ideas and innovations are coming around payment specifically and how doing old things you know, not old things, but old technology and being able to tweak it to meet the needs of today's demands, right? And how you can look at payments just a little bit differently and how big a change that makes in the market or to their cardholder base. Um, I think the next one really looking at infrastructure um, and technology. Again, 60% report having IT infrastructure that makes innovation easier compared to just 12% of the average performers. You know, that's you know, five times as many, or um, it's 73% of the top performers said their core payment systems are well suited for innovation. And that leads to things like flexibility and configurability and the things that we talked about. And, and as you mentioned, right, um, for speed, top performers really get to market faster and they complete their projects um, on time. Um, I think it really getting down to some of the granular parts of this is that flexible payments and IT infrastructure is really a primary factor leading to successful innovation. So innovation really, from what this tells me, is that, you know, it's a market requirement and, and flexibility is key to that. Um, I think there's something to be said about legacy technologies and core payment systems that are, you know, hampering potentially that innovation growth. Um, I think that what we heard also in the survey was that more than a third of all FIs say um, that their systems are making innovation hard. And really that shouldn't be how it is, right? It should be flexible. And, and a lot of these um, FinTechs that we see, I mean, they're used to things moving quickly, right? They're used to being able to work with innovations and, or excuse me, with systems that you can, you know, adapt with and, and play with and, and really start to test and look up things. And I, I think this is, um, 
a little bit of a wake up call for industry. You know, if a core system or the um, can't manage this, you know, the hole these FIs are getting into is going to get bigger. And if you think about your analogy to Norway, right, they got into that hole in 2006 and they had to figure out how to get out of it. And here they are now, right? So I, I think you know what what I heard you say is 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 hard. If, if innovation is hard, then it means it takes more time, and it also means that it may not exactly be what what a consumer may want, but what is possible given the constraints. And if you think about the the highly competitive market, not just within the banking ecosystem as we as we know it today, but you mentioned the fintechs that are that are chipping away at some of those, those those key products and services. I mean, it is that is the call to action, really. It is mm -hmm. uh, it is it is having these these flexible um, you know infrastructures and an innovation mindset. That sounds so cliche, but if you have an innovation mindset in an organization, you get the funding, you have the commitment of the organization to get things out on time, and you can actually then do what you need to do to meet customer requirements before someone else gets there first. I think that's exactly right, right? With technology changing so quickly, um, again, in banking, with fintechs, I mean, just with the mobile phone, right? Um, you know, our card holders are used to seeing things differently. Um, and we see this a lot with our clients where they want to adopt, adapt current solutions to their need, right? About you know tweaking those solutions, making it more flexible, configurable, um, and I think that again that underlying technology is really the key to be able to do a lot of this. Um, and I think to your point, right? The it's about survival a little bit. These top performers they have the technology and the funding, um, and they have the wherewithal I think to to leapfrog their competitors. So it's really about now is the time. How do you focus on it? How do you be in this game? How do you make it? you know, just part of what you do every day as an FI. Um, and, you know, it's about working with, I think, your partners, too, to, to how do you stay on top of wallet, right? Um, how do you work with them to get what you need and be flexible and get things out to market quickly so that you're ahead of the game and meeting that cardholder or member or customer demand? So, so let's let's drill into infrastructure um, just at, at a little more granular level. and. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. We see this in so many parts of, of payments and commerce broadly where technology is the, you know, democratizer of, of opportunity, but, but clearly in this space as well. Absolutely. Um, so I think, again, um, when we look at infrastructure and technology, you know, we talked a little bit before about the rational pieces of, you know, the other three points of planning well, having a healthy budget, you know, getting fast to market. But that critical variable is really um, technology and how it's used. Um, I think, you know, we talk a lot about technology being able to level the playing field. Um, you know, as you said before, I think, you know, if you look at it, if there's, 73% of the top performers in this survey said their core payment systems are well suited for innovation. That's a pretty big number, right? Based on what technology is in the system. And I think that's key. Um, you know, you think about the different players now, it, it, just in the last few years, right? Let's take the last five years and the changes that have come to banking into the market. Um, you know, if the core payment systems aren't flexible enough now, you know, how do you make it work? You know, how do you spend the time and resources doing those types of things? I think, again, the good news is that size doesn't really matter, right? It, it's it's not a limiting factor here, and I think that's the exciting piece of it. Again, going back to Norway, right? Norway is a super small country when it comes to population, but they're ahead. It's the same thing here when you think about it. You know, it's, it's, it's again about what you look at from a technology perspective. And what's, what are the most important pieces of technology? You know, configurability and flexibility of those systems, um, the ability to create and build programs, test them, you know, get some of that feedback and scale. Um, and, you know, one thing we see a lot of uh, in different programs from our clients is really that testing, right, the sandbox, testing those features, getting them to market and launching it quickly um, and acting to meet those demands. Um, I think there's, you know, a few more examples of what we could do, you know, what we could talk about, but maybe we should dig a little bit deeper into the numbers. Yeah, I think, 
you know, it, it, it's, it always is great to see the data because lots of times we talk conceptually about yeah. these things. And I think part of the, the impetus for this, this study was to begin to quantify the readiness, if you will, of, of financial institutions for innovation in the, in the payments area. I think this is pretty, mm -hmm. this is pretty clear, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, in terms of the, the impact of infrastructure Absolutely. and technology on being a top performer? Absolutely. Um, I think just looking at these numbers, I mean, I'll like pick out a couple of them, but, you know, 60% of top performers have that configurable payments processing technology. I mean, it's twice as many, right, as the average or uh, the middle performing FIs. You know, that's a big, big difference when you're trying to innovate and get ahead. Um, mm -hmm. And also, if you look at the next number, I mean, over 50% of those top performers have multifunction capability, you know, so being able to use different, you know, features and components and tie it all together, um, having those different um, functionality available and being able to leverage them for their solutions. And, and, and really that multifunction capability, I think, you know, effectively helps them future-proof their programs so they could implement any type of program that they wanted. Um, you know, I, I think when you look at especially the multifunction, but also the configurability, you know, we have a client who is in multiple different markets, um, countries with multiple different currencies, and they were going to have to do with a lot of the other situations, you know, have one different card program for each country. But in some of these areas, right, you cross borders all the time, uh, different currency cross those borders, right? Um, so being able to really have a card that has multiple currencies, different types of currencies, whether they were, you know, the yen or a euro or a dollar or a rewards currency, you know, made them have a better situation, made them top of wallet because they had one card that could be used anywhere, right? Again, those technologies have been there. It's just, again, how you use them. Right. Right. I also think the other interesting um, finding was this, this, this notion of, of a testing environment. And I remember mm -hmm. talking to a few folks after we we identified this as a deficiency, frankly, um, for many people, we uh, many of the banks that we, that we talked to, but, but certainly an attribute of the top performers, as being very surprised that this just doesn't exist. Um, but mm -hmm. it obviously it obviously needs to. Yeah. And and I think that that's a, a whole testing scenario is actually pretty, I was a little actually surprised with some of these numbers too. So, you know, one is testing, but one is really how you use it, right? How you take sandbox to scale as we talk about. Um, how do you take a either a portfolio or a test group or something like that and really test it in market and then be able to scale it quickly um, and also iterate. Um, you know, I think that's another big thing and, um, you know, if the core processing platforms really don't support this, and I think the number was, what, 83% of the respondents yeah, said yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, um, that's, 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 pretty, that's pretty indicting. It, it is, and but the top performers all said that they did have this ability. So it, it, it's a, um, you know, it can be a game changer. Just that functionality could be a huge game changer for any FI in this space. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I, we've got a lot of ground to cover. We could talk more mm -hmm. about this. Let's move on to to planning, which um, which I think is an interesting um, dimension as well. We, we you know we talked about the relationship between planning, um, investment, and speed to market, which we'll which, which we'll dig into in just a minute. But um, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on this. That that P2P and digital wallets are now no longer differentiators, they're table stakes. Um, and, and engagement really is the, is, is, is the future. That's, uh, that was an interesting takeaway. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to what really drives innovation. You know, and if you think about it from a, you know, consumer or cardholder perspective, you know, they have more technology in the palm of their hand right now than they ever have before. And they have the expectation that you're there able to use technology how any other app works, how any other digital function works, and they also have more access to technology, you know, mobility, the convenience, all of those things. So there's a big piece of this that's about meeting customer needs, um, keeping pace with the, those changing behaviors, and, you know, catching up to the digital mo um, mobile market. And, 
you know, you got to have that today to stay top of wallet. And planning and make sure you're focusing on that is really the best um, the best practice that those top performers use. And I think there's a big gap here between where most FIs are in their innovation um, and where top innovating FIs will be focusing their resources. And I think that that's what you see here, right? That P2P and digital wallets are now table stakes. Now, if we look at some of those numbers about it, um, you know, 93% of our top performers have brought to market digital wallets. That's a big number, right? Yeah. At ninety-three yeah. percent, you know. Whereas, you know, it's much, much lower. But you know, they're starting to keep up, and it's still a focus, I think, for some of those other mid-tier, you know, performers. Um, you know, even fifty-three percent have rolled out contactless. Again, you know, contactless is something you know we've all been talking about for many years at this point in time. But over fifty percent of them already have it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, 60%, way over half, um, say, you know, they've executed on that P2P functionality. And I think what a lot of this comes from is that, you know, where the top performers look at their competitors, number one, um, they look at their competitors as the larger FIs as well as FinTech players, right? They're not, you know, the bank down the street. <laughs> they're a little bit different. And so they know that they have to kind of catch up with some of these technologies that we just talked about and be ahead of the game with that so they can focus on other things. So, so, so Lisa, I guess the question is, um, you know, we see, we see the disparity here between the top and the, and the mm -hmm. middle, much less the top and the bottom. Um, how does someone in the middle catch up? I mean, it, it requires, I guess it's, it's, it's Norway in, in 2006. It's introspection, focus, and right. investment. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. You know, you have to figure out, I think th there's a couple things to your, your point. It is Norway in 2006, right? And whatever, March of 2006 when after the Olympics and they're looking at it. And I think as an FI, you have to say, you know, you have to understand your customer. I mean, I think that's a key thing. What are the most important things out of these that have become table stakes that your customers are using all the time to stay ahead, right? Where is it that you currently sit and what you have focused? What are you currently planning for? And does it really make sense? Should it be something you're working on? Does it meet the demands of what your cardholder or your customer base is looking at, right? Um, and then once you, you figure that out, how do you plan for it, right? Where's the focus? How do you get that strategic focus of the organization to be a part of it and really back it? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more, but I think there's a lot to be said about metrics, right? And how you look at these things and how you focus on where you are and what needs to happen next. Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Lisa, go ahead. I'll let you no, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to say the, the, the interesting thing about um, what's in the playbook, which we'll tell you guys how to get um, at, at the end of this, but, but, you know, this extraction from the playbook is you, you can see um, where the areas of focus are almost out of necessity. You know, we talked about um, focusing on the necessity and playing catch-up is certainly not the markings of a top performer, but, mm -hmm. but that all takes time and energy and mind share while the top performers are out engaging customers acquiring customers and, 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 and keeping those customers loyal. So this does, you know, this does almost become like a little mini, a little mini roadmap of how right. FIs and payments uh, are, are evolving. Yep, absolutely. Well, it's, uh, gosh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's so interesting. I mean, we could talk, we could talk, we could, we could drill into this and talk about it for a long time, but let's move into the methodologies that are driving. So we, we've now um, identified infrastructure and technology. We, we understand the reason uh, to plan and what, what should be planned for. Um, how, in fact, are the top performers actually making all that happen? So I think one of the biggest things is they're proactive. You know, let's start with that. Um, but they also use a broad range of innovation methods. I mean, you see here that 70% of them use three or more methods of innovation. Um, 
you know, things like sandbox to scale or um, customer suggested innovation, you know, they test with customers, employees, and they do cash and ROI calculations. I think we, we talked about that a little bit. But, um, you know, three of these methods are used by more than 70% of the top performers, where only two are used by more than 50% of those middle performers. So, you know, it, it, a lot of it is about, you know, the vision of being proactive instead of reactive, um, about using different ways to look at it um, and to apply it um, so that you can get different results and you can see success in different ways. So, so let's, so let's look at let's look at how the yeah. numbers the numbers shake out because I think it kind of gets mm -hmm. to the point about being proactive. And I want to I want to come back to the vendor suggestions in, in just a minute, but. Sure. But help us uh, help us decipher this uh, this chart. Yeah, it's an interesting. I mean, some of the key things here. You know, you've got sandbox to scale. You know, there's a 15 basis points difference between a top performer and you know a mid tier performer. Same thing with um, you know a lot of those top performers have their own tools and products. I think one of the things that I found really interesting as I looked at this is that you know. 40% or sorry, 47% of our top performers take customer suggested innovation, whereas it's flipped on the reverse side, right? Where 44% of those mid pair are taking it from those vendor suggestions, right? Or outside vendors. Um, and, and this goes back to what I said before about those top performers being proactive and um, they have to figure out how to create new solutions to meet those customer needs rather than waiting for a partner or vendor to say to them, have you thought about this? That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's another, I guess, tool um, to, to look at, but it's also about, you know, as an SI, looking at it saying, what do my customers want and what do I need? And they may not be something that anybody's coming to you today and say that we could, you know, you, have you thought about this? You know, it could be something that you're trying to come up with yourself. So that those two in particular for me were pretty um, telling, I think, you know, the proactive versus reactive of how I saw it. Yeah, um, I, I, and I, I, want, I wanted to just, while we're, while we're on that point, I wanted yeah. to, to probe a little bit more about that because sometimes, you know, it is the role of a third party to yep. offer suggestions, right? Um, I'm sure Absolutely. you do that. With you. You know, with with your with your clients to say, hey, you know, we see a lot. Um, mm -hmm. These are these are cool things that leading edge FIs are doing in this in this area. So there is a middle ground, right? There is absolutely there's a middle ground. I wasn't suggesting. I guess I wasn't intending to suggest that you know you don't listen to your partners or vendors or you don't work with them because a lot can come from that. Um, I think all I was planning is it's it's only one piece though, right? Yep. That you don't want to be heavily reliant on only that. I think you know you as an FI, you know your customers best, right? And listening to them could give you a lot of insight, and and it could be you know you survey them or you're talking to them on the front lines or you're having a question in branch or something like that, and it spends to another idea and it, it kind of flows. Um, I think what this is, though, is that, you know, we also have a lot of our clients that come to us and say, can you do this? Or we're trying to do that. How can you help us, right? So that's a, you collaborate and partner. So we bring suggestions to the table all the time, but I think it's also about not waiting for those suggestions always, right? It's, it's a balance between what are you hearing from your customers so you can be proactive about what you want to do as an organization, um, versus having a partner that's thinking about your organization that way and bringing things to the table and, and, and just kind of balancing it out a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I also think that the, um, you know, the fact that 93% of the top performers mm -hmm. are disciplined about having some sort of vetting, you know, a, an ROI calculation or something that basically mm -hmm. says, yeah, we're hearing this from our customers, but does it make sense for our business, and I think that you right. have to have both of those things, right? Because customers may say, you know, you should, I don't know, you should let do you should let dogs, you know, do dogs run your branch for every Wednesday, which would, of course, not be a very good idea, um, <laughs> unless it, unless they were all border collies and they were very smart. But um, but but you, you get the point. I mean, there has to That's be totally some point. listening and vetting before you right crazy. I think one of the key things about it is, you know, how do you understand performance? 
right? Right. Um, how do – understanding how the – the programs are working, the functionality is working, it really has an impact on the bottom line. And that's what, you know, you're seeing is they're assigning metrics to gauge that ROI. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think of is that um, a failure, right, is okay if you understand through metrics why something failed, right, because it equals better solutions later. So. It's not necessarily that all these cash or the ROI calculations have a positive story to tell, but it's that they do have a story that you can uncover and really understand because, you know, that, that's one of the best things about innovation. Not everything always works out, and it shouldn't because you learn from that failure. Um, and so I, I think truly understanding those metrics and those calculations along with how that affects your strategic priorities, you know, the business or customer impact, I mean, that really helps the top performer get ahead because you're taking those metrics along with the big picture of things. But this was a really, I, I actually started a couple times because I thought it was a, a, a pretty big difference here, right? There's a pretty big delta there between that um, and what's going on. I think the other thing is just the takeaway on the sandbox to scale and how those top performers are actually using the sandbox and that functionality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I agree with you. So, so let's kind of sum up the 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 top performer, uh, the top FI performers when it comes to payments innovation. We we we've touched on a lot of these, but but I, I want to I want to drill into one aspect in particular. But I'll let you go. I'll let you do the rundown. Um, okay. You know, kind of. The, 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 the lessons that we, that, that we have learned. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the first thing is innovation is a top, prefer, is a top priority in payments. So that specific focus on payment and innovation um, is one of the first things. Um, I think the ability to innovate, right, the ability to think through it, um, you know, it, it's a critical competency to be able to have innovation in everything that you do or as a, um, a core competency within the organization. And it's one of the things that obviously lead to getting to the market faster with the things that customers want. Um, and we need to make sure that as all FIs that you don't really get, um, again, you're not outperformed by these top performers. How do you compete? And this is one of the ways to do it. Um, I think you've heard throughout the, you know, our conversation today, right? The right technology is an equalizer and it's something that everybody can leverage. Um, and I think we talked a little bit more about those innovations and methodologies and having multiple and making sure that planning, because it, it can make a difference um, and it helps you get ahead, but really about, you know, focusing on technology. I think the technology is the grease in the wheels to really make it, you know, make you get to market faster. And I think anyone can get it and use it. Um, and I think it really does support that innovation and, and what goes along with it. Yeah, I, I mean the innovation mindset is is the is the thing that I wanted to drill into uh, just yep. a little bit. We talk about it. I referenced it. You know, you referenced it. We 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 kind of throw it around as if it's if it's easy. It sounds like it should be easy, but you know, without you know the risk of of wearing out the Norway welcome uh, too much, but. Uh, <laughs> It was a lot of hard work to develop this mindset on the part of that, you know, that whole country and the teams that it produced to be a top performer, and and it requires discipline and a focus. And I guess, mm -hmm. um, I guess these are the four steps that that as we looked at the the index itself and uh, and sussed out the, uh, the 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 data from the top performers that we thought. Um, were were the remarkable characteristics of, of of a top performer with an innovation mindset. Number three, I want to get your thoughts on ditch the innovation yeah. lab. It's sort of sounds counterintuitive, but uh, anyway, it take said, it through. Okay, yeah, I have some specific comments about that innovation lab. Um, so I think you know, first of all, and you and I have said it right. It's making innovation a core competency, and I think it's it. It's about making it not scary for an organization. I think it's about talking through what innovation really is. Again, it doesn't have to be the next big thing. It doesn't have to be a, a huge project that takes away resources from everything else. But it is a mindset. Um, and it, it is about, 
you know, making innovation central to what everybody does day in and day out. It doesn't matter if you're working on DDA or, you know, something else, it, it, it really doesn't. It's about really focusing there. And I think the, the key there that helps with it is the flexible payments and IT infrastructure can help create, you know, more agile FIs and, and help make innovation in everyday, everyday practice. If you've got something that's flexible and configurable, it's a little bit easier to think about how you could make a change that could become an innovation within your organization. Um, it, again, it's about making it central to running a payments business, you know, thinking about the different ideas, iterating on them and testing them. So, you know, it could be something that maybe it's something that you start with is just how you run a meeting, right? Um, how you think about it and brainstorm a little bit differently and try to get some other functionality, but really making it part of, you know, the thread of your organization. Um, the second thing is really about they monetize their innovation. So we talked about this, right? Um, but successful innovations are tied directly to a business strategy, to a specific agenda that has goals, and then having the funding or the budget to really back them up. Um, you know, remember, 75% of top performers allocate 50% of their budget to innovation. So it's not 10% that they're keeping at the side. It's actually focusing on it and, and, and bringing it back. Um, and then the next is really about just seeing the innovation lab. So I think there's a couple things about the innovation lab that happens is, well, the idea for an innovation lab, I think, is, it's a good one, right, to actually have a focus on innovation. That's a positive, but I think what happens is they end up being in a silo, right? You have them somewhere off, innovating, brainstorming, nobody else knows what they're doing. You know, there's it doesn't become part of the everyday workload of everybody, right? It's not that everyday mindset, and so it's it's separate from the rest of the organization. I think it also doesn't necessarily allow for incorporating that real-time customer feedback um, you know, immediately being able to scale something or bring that feature to market quickly. I think to, in today's really social and mobile economy, customer feedback and iteration matters and how quickly you can attest to it um, and how quickly you can work with it, it is the key now, right? And I don't think that innovation labs necessarily allow you to do that, right? Um, they, they, it almost becomes another silo, at least how I've seen them working in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a good point because to have an innovation mindset means that innovation kind of permeates every aspect of the organization, not just an area that's been given a budget and people to cook stuff up that then right. gets thrown over the wall for for, right. for others to then take. Yeah, because I think too, I mean, so many people, you know, are working in areas day in and day out. And I, I, I know they all have fabulous ideas about what can be done. Um, mm -hmm. It's about saying, what are the resources to get it done? And it's not just that group over on the other side of the wall, right? That That's cooking things up, as you said. It, it's really about that mindset and listening to what you hear throughout your organization because I don't think it matters where you are. There are a lot of people with really good ideas and a lot of people, especially those that are in tune with what cardholders or customers or members are saying, um, can bring a lot of different ideas, right? Yeah, I, for sure. Um, a question that may be a good one to introduce now. Um, Cryptocurrency as a payment service. The, the question is for the common banks. I think I think that you know perhaps more appropriately for for the uh, the FIs that that we studied, which are you know below the twenty five the twenty five big guys. Um, is this on people's three year roadmap? I'm going to keep my I'm going to I'm going to bite my tongue while you answer. <laughs> I'm going to say. Not completely, and I know that's a, a cop-out answer maybe, but here's why. Um, I think there are a lot that are looking at these cryptocurrencies and saying, what do we do? But I think they're also looking at their cardholder or their customer base and saying, do we have the interest? Do they need them? Don't get me wrong. There are absolutely segments of the of cardholder bases, depending on the FI, that have this need, but not all of them do, right? Not everybody's looking at it, and I don't necessarily know if it will be a, um, 
if you don't have that need from your cardholders or from your members or your banks, uh, your banks, I, I think that um, it's a hard thing to completely focus on. I think what we're seeing is the focus is more around the engagement, right, the data and analytics around it, and do you mean this is something that you need to watch? you need to pay attention to, if you see the need come up, that is when you can focus on it a little bit more. It's not to say that you wanna just, you know, put it on the shelf to get dusty. Um, it's about understanding what the actual need is for your customers. Yeah, and so, so what far do you we have, have to say though? I'm curious. Oh, oh gosh, well, uh, <laughs> a, a, a long and well-documented uh, history of, of how Maybe I feel yeah. about this, but I think it's, you know, pe people aren't using cryptocurrency to, to transact. Um, right. You know, they're, they're a method of transport, you know, interesting, you know, interesting, fascinating technology. But, but I think, I think we're a very long way away from people transacting in, you know, name mm -hmm. the coin. But it, there's not going to be a Lisa coin or a Karen coin anytime soon that people are going to go right. in and use to buy a cup of coffee. But uh, right. it, is, it is interesting, nonetheless, in terms of you know the the technology behind it. Um, yep. Another another question that I think is is really is really relevant. Um, so we've now spent the last. 48 minutes talking about what it means to be a top performer, and the evidence is, is, is the evidence. I mean, the data is the data, and uh, mm -hmm. a, a big part of that data story is the need to have a technology that enables a very flexible and agile way to bring innovation to market, do testing, uh, and so forth. Um, suppose that's not available to you as an FI, um, and you know that you need to do it. I mean, what do you, so, so then what do you do? It's, it's making a change is also a risk. It's a risk yeah. not to innovate. It's a risk to take a step and innovate and change. It's, it's, it's not an easy decision to make. How, no. how do you have conversations with FIs? Well, I think one thing is is that there's a couple of components to that risk, right? If they don't have it today and they, you know, they're looking at it and saying, okay, what do I do? Um, there's a couple of different things here, a couple of different types of risk. There's technical risk um, and there's business risk, right? Um, and I think they both need to be considered. Uh, you know, I, I think one thing is as you're looking at it, you know, not making a change is just as much, a, you know, a choice as making one. Um, and I think you have to look at kind of your business agenda. You know, you have to decide first and foremost, what is the risk to your business? You know, it, you have to understand that, you know, innovation for the sake of it is not necessarily a useful thing. But if you truly understand, you know, the needs of the base and, and you know, understanding how you need to get to market faster with different solutions, um, you know, you're able to do that. And I think that, when you think about the technical risk versus the business risk, you also have to do an assessment of, you know, what it is you have today, what you think it's going to take to get there, or at least have conversations with different partners about what they think it will take. Um, you know, cost is always one thing that's involved here, but um, I think that, you know, I don't think that's the biggest thing here. I think there's a lot here that's around, um, you know, your day-to-day -day business risk. If you go with a different partner or a different vendor or a different technology, because it's a little unknown within the organization, what do you do about it, right? You know, that's one piece of it. But it's also a technical risk to make sure everything works well. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that those top performers don't really wait. You know, they're proactively using innovation to solve some of their problems. So the question becomes, can you afford to wait? Is that risk out there to change? Now. There's all sorts of other things that go into this, you know, whether it's contracts and things like that. Right. But I think that there's another way to look at it. You could also look at doing, you know, uh, take a chance with a smaller portion of your portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there something you've been meaning to try and you want to try it? Well, you could try it with a different vendor for that small segment as a starting point, right? See if it works, see how you understand it, see if you're comfortable with it. Does it make sense? And it's not as big of a risk if you look at it that way. Um, but again, that also gives you access to probably more flexible technology um, and, you know, different ways that you can configure a program um, rather than having to hard code something and wait. 
Interesting. So, so I, I guess what I hear you saying, I think, and I think it's good advice. It's, it's where are you, kind of mm -hmm. in the spectrum of performer. And I think, I think instinctively, even if you don't have the data about your FI, you kind of get a sense in looking at both the index and 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 this particular playbook to kind of size that up. But but then look at the technical versus business risk, and, and I guess recognize it's not an all or nothing proposition, that there are ways to Absolutely. You say, carve out a piece and, and give something else a try, and then, and then kind of make a, make a judgment from there. Um, but I, I, think, I, think, I think that's good advice. Um, yeah. Remind you before, before, we, before we, we sign off here, um, I want to leave everyone with this, this, this notion of what the top performers are really focused on. So, you know, we know that there's a mindset. We know that they're allocating a, allocating a lot of money to innovation because it is part of what that organization is all about. We know they're planning and, uh, and testing, but, but investing specifically. Um, Lisa, reprise the conversation about what, in fact, people are spending their money on. Yeah, so I think, again, um, what we saw from this was that, you know, half of top performers allocate 75% or more of their payments budget towards innovation. And that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot, right? That's a, that's a big focus. Yeah. And if you think back really on this section on planning that we spoke about, um, I think this, this talks about, you know, a lot about where they're placing a, um, or sorry, where they're making their bets or placing their bets. They're really about in, um, investing in more complex areas, um, but those areas probably have likely a, a little bit of a higher return than others. I think if you look at it, um, and when we talked about planning, there were things like, we talked about payment technology, there's consumer engagement, uh, data mm -hmm. analytics, the mobile and digital space, and then the user experience. And I think one of the things that contributes to that is that, um, one, those are all areas that you can get to some of the other areas, right? You know, if you think payment technology is where they're investing, well, some of the things they were focused on were digital wallets, right, and P2P and some of those payment technologies. So they're, they're investing in these broader categories and areas, um, and I think these technologies and disciplines really require investment in not only technology, um, but in staff, right, um, competent staff who have experience in it to understand how you can bring better insight to the issuer, get them closer to the customer, and really focus on some of these other areas. You know, one thing I want to uh, note is that, you know, it has the top performers is looking at, you know, fraud management in the past three years. This is not saying that they're not going to continue to focus on, you know, fraud management, right? They're just going to use some of these other disciplines and areas to do that, like consumer engagement. That's not just a marketing. That's a, that's a complete engagement with the customer or the user experience or using data analytics to drive deeper results and, and get better understanding of those areas, like fraud management, to get to it. Um, so really, you know, it's those key areas, right? Uh, payment innovation or technology, consumer engagement, data analytics, that digital space, and then user experience. So, so, so specifically with consumer engagement, what are you hearing from the FIs you talk to? I mean, what, what is within that bundle of things? What seems to be a priority? Yeah, I think it's a combination, right? I think if you look at it, there's, um, you know, the marketing solicitation, you know, that's always a, a priority, but really it's about usage, keeping that, the, the um, either cards or, you know, the devices that usage top of mind and, and to continue that usage, because I think we, we see them getting a lot of insights just based on how they understand those cardholders or those um, customers using things. So I think that's one big play, but um, what I find is interesting is, you know, you, you hear a lot about the mobile and digital play and those types of things, but I think um, one of the bigger areas is really that customer support, right? Because that's just as much as customer engagement as any other space, right? So if it's in branch, if it's over the phone, if it's, you know, mobile, you know, if it's text messages, websites, et cetera, um, I, I think the key there is how do you really, and what our, a lot of our clients talk about is, you know, how do you make it a complete experience where 
you're pushing and pulling information and you're getting it from them, but you're also giving it to them. It's not a one way street. Um, and it's uh, different ways on how they can interact with their cardholders or their, you know, clients or members. Um, it's just different ways of getting information to them and, and having them more engaged in what's going on with their relationship with our clients on a day to day basis. So it could be anything as menial as, you know, getting more signups for alerts on transactions um, to some robust campaigns that they, they want to hear back from clients on. It just depends on what they're doing. But I, I see it being much more of a holistic thing rather than segmented um, mm -hmm. and how they look at their campaigns and those engagements right now. I mean, I think I think your point about about usage is a good one. You know, we we, we talk about top of wallet sort of casually um, as a you know as a foregone conclusion that that's a priority. But I think in the in the digital age, particularly as the Internet of Things gives us more endpoints for cards to be registered and accounts to be established, or accounts that have um, uh, cards already registered to be proliferated among those endpoints. I mean, who gets there first really matters because it really does. Uh, it's, out, it's out of it's out of sight, out of mind, and uh, literally. Right. So, so yep. it, it's 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 nothing to uh, to kind of brush off as a as a priority. It is a very important priority. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this day and age, you've got to be top of mind and you have to get there first. Yep. It's the way well, that you keep on top of things. I see that we're almost out of our time. We've got yeah. a few seconds left, but I will time time flies when you're having fun. I guess okay. I guess I would say be, be Norway. Um that's sort of my <laughs> my final my final that's, shot. I don't know. Like that. You, you, you probably have something much uh, much much more clever than that. Um but um uh, you know, there, 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 there are two, two, two pictures here on the, on the, on the screen. The one is uh, to the far right is the, is the Innovation Readiness Index, which provides the baseline, if you will, for understanding um, the series of playbooks of which this is one documenting the top performers. Um, that they kind of go as a series. Please do uh, take the time to read them. They're very accessible and easy, easy to read and have a lot of great calls to action in terms of what to do, checklists and thought provoking um, suggestions to kind of get you, get you on your way. Um, Lisa, final, final word, you have the final word. Um, I just, I think the biggest thing is, is that there is so much opportunity out there and I think it's on every FI that there's so much you know, they, they have the option to do so many things and getting that right technology is a good first start. Um, I think following some of these steps and getting that mindset can go a long, long way um, in making sure that you're a top performer too. And I think uh, this survey has been a great message about it doesn't really matter what size you are. It all matters about, you know, how you plan how you look at things and how you make sure that you have the right pieces like technology and planning in place to get it done. Absolutely. Lisa, thanks. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate all your time today and your great insights. And thanks to everyone who gave us your time today to listen in. Um, enjoyed having the conversation. We'll talk again yeah. soon. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.